Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Last week, we at ABME began our series of conversations on black leadership with our public advocate, Jumani Williams. I thought it was a powerful conversation, and I know from the overwhelming response we got from many, many of you, that you felt his words were, penetra his words were penetrating and thought-provoking, and that they inspired action. Today, we have the honor of hearing from our Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives, J. Philip Thompson. I have seen firsthand how Deputy Mayor Thompson inspires people, both in small and large groups, to be their best selves, to engage in our civic life to the benefit of all New Yorkers and especially New Yorkers in need. Deputy Mayor Thompson drives the insight and programs that address some of the biggest challenges our city faces. He oversees the city's efforts on the census which of course is near and dear to our hearts at Abbey, and which I had to mention first. But he leads many important programs that uplift New Yorkers, including the Minority and Women-Owned Business Enterprises Program, the Office of Workforce Development, and the Young Men's Initiative, to name just a few. His dedication to our city goes back truly decades. He served in the Dinkins administration, and you know our love for Mayor Dinkins at Abbey as the Deputy General Manager of Op for Operations and Development, and before that, he worked in the Manhattan Borough President's Office. In fact, his unwavering belief in civic responsibility and government's obligation to make a positive difference in people's lives that drove him to return to New York and to government in 2018 after nearly two decades of teaching at MIT. When he got the call to join the de Blasio administration, he was actually teaching a course in the Amazon. And we are very lucky that the good professor answered the call both literally and figuratively. Recently, Deputy Mayor Thompson's impassioned speech about the importance of Juneteenth and his petition for the removal of Confederate General Robert E. Lee's name from public spaces showed just how far we still have to go as a society to achieve justice and inclusion for all. It is a topic he explored in his book, Double Trouble, Black Mayors, Black Communities, and the Call for Deep Democracy. To quote the Deputy Mayor, freedom and democracy doesn't live on a piece of paper. Democratic rights have to be understood and acted upon by the people, otherwise they do not exist. To know the deputy mayor is to respect him and to watch him work is to take pride that our city is lucky enough to have someone as wise as he to lead us. I'm excited to have the chance to hear from him today and know that we in our Abney community can learn from him and use his wisdom to be better and do better and to make communities more just or our community more just, equitable and inclusive. As you know, over the next few weeks, we'll continue to hear from other black leaders across the city, including the head of the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker, Emmy Award winning journalist, Cheryl Wills, president of 1199 SEIU, George Gresham, and Letitia James, our attorney general. And I hope everyone continues to join us. I also wanna thank for this program, Melva, Mil Melva Miller and Laura Calacuccio from our staff who did an amazing job of putting this together. Thank you all. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Julio Peterson, the Vice President of Real Estate at the Schubert Organization. Julio is one of the leaders of the theater district. I should say the theater district, a massive multi-billion dollar industry that is a key driver of our economy. And he works closely with our city and state on quality of life issues, zoning, as well as equity to ensure a vibrant Broadway and a vibrant Broadway community. He has a formidable resume, having worked at KPMG, Partnership for New York, and EDC. I'm proud to say he's an AVNI board member and that his passion and advocacy for access and representation of communities of color in all sectors of city life has helped make New York more equitable and inclusive. He is frank with us about the work we as AVNI have to do ahead of us on this front and I'm grateful for his guidance and passion. Thank you, Julio. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson, it's such an honor to be here with you. I uh, remember when I first came out of college and was working at EDC and you were with Mayor Dinkins and everybody held you in such high regard. So it's just such an honor to, to see you and, and be able to talk to you today. And I know you have a full plate. We have a lot going on in the city, um, whether it be COVID or the other equity issues that we have to address. Um, they've been around those equity issues for a long time. As Steven said, um, you also have an academic background as well as having worked for city government. And one of the things that uh, we want to start to talk about is sort of what are your views on power politics and racial justice in New York City 
sort of based on your career and and and, and your and your academic uh, uh, teaching, sort of what do you see is the evolution of that in New York City? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Stephen, for that gracious in introduction, and it's good to see you, Julio. Um, I always thought Julio was a basketball player. You know, he had that kind of physique and and build. Um, but you know, Julio's a man of many talents. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, first, I, what I see in New York is that um, African Americans have achieved more electoral power than ever before, um, and probably have the strongest um, Black electoral representation in the country. Um, so there's a strong Black, Latino, and Asian caucus at the city council level. There's an African-American assembly speaker, an African-American majority leader. Um, so that is a huge shift um, from when Dinkins was mayor, uh, for example. And it symbolizes potential. Uh, simultaneously, there's been a decline in civic participation and capacity in low-income communities of color in this city, particularly Black and, and Latino. Um, I remember back in the 1980s in central Brooklyn, there was something called the Black United Front, headed by Reverend Herbert Daughtry. There was something called the Coalition for Community Empowerment that Al Van and Audrey Bino organized and there was just widespread conversation about, okay, what's the policy agenda for the community? Um, how do we track progress on that agenda? Um, let's call on elected officials to come back and explain to the community how they're moving forward on the agenda. Um, there used to be a uh, Black and Puerto Rican legislative caucus that every year at the state level, every year published a budget and before the state budget saying, here are the things we wanna see in the state budget. And those things were discussed in community meetings. I don't see any of that anymore. Um, so that's been a, a change, a decline, which is ironic um, because you would think with more electoral representation that would indicate greater civic participation. I think one of the errors that have been made is thinking that electing people is enough. Um, if you elect someone to the city council or state legislature or mayor or governor or president, that that's enough. You don't have to do anything else. And I, I think we're finding that's not true at all. Um, last thing I'll say is what's lacking in the black community and Latino community um, is what I would call an idea infrastructure. There's no agenda. So what's, what's the jobs program that uh, elected officials of color are advocating? What is the healthcare reform that elected officials of color are debating and advocating? What is the position of elected officials towards new technology, which is transforming the economy and what things are imperative for the community to really be involved in, in tech. All those things I think are, are wanting. And in part it's because we, A, there's never been this amount of power, but B, there's no infrastructure to support it with ideas, policy analysis, and so on. So I think that's a challenge at the moment. Excellent, I, I really appreciate that. And do you think that given what's going on now with all of the sort of social unrest, Black Lives Matter, and, and all these different sort of initiatives and in different industries and sectors, do you think that that's gonna be able to spur that type of sort of community uh, action as you were saying before? Because I, I remember the days of Al Van and United Black Front and, and, and even the, the coalitions, and there were a lot of more sort of local institutions that were trying to uplift our com communities of color. Do you think that this time in, in our history will help spur that again? I, I do. And I think we're 
on the cusp of even more momentous change in this country. Um, and I would say a couple of things about it. One, uh, right now in more than 80% of medium and large size American cities, a majority of the population is Black, Latino, and Asian. And if you add younger white people, 80% of whom voted for Obama twice in cities, that is a very powerful potential coalition. Um, that's the coalition that elected uh, de Blasio twice. That's the coalition that elected Beto in Texas. That's the coalition that was behind um, uh, Stacey Abrams in Georgia. That's the coalition that elected a lesbian mayor of, of, of uh, Utah, in Utah, of, what's the, name, um, what's the name of the major city in Utah? Um, Salt Lake? Probably. Salt Lake City elected a lesbian mayor. Um, Those are the only two cities I know in Utah, by the yeah. way. <laughs> but that coalition is, is, is in formation. And those are the people you saw on the streets as part of the movement for Black Lives. And um, I think that is the tsunami. It's a demographic tsunami that is dominant in cities, but it's going to become dominant in America in the next couple of decades. And the majority of protesters that I saw marching through the city as part of Black Lives Matter, I'd say 70% of them were white. And I saw Asians, I saw Latinos. So this is something very different that's never happened in America before, ever. Um, since 1964, when civil rights legislation passed, a majority of white voters have voted not for a Democrat ever since, to this day. And I think we're about to see that shift this time, this election, and the shift is gonna be for a very long time. We're just gonna see a different America. And these young people are unhappy, not just with policing and George Floyd, they're unhappy with the state of the country. They don't know what their own future is gonna look like. They're concerned about climate change. They're concerned about the economy. Wall Street's doing great right now. They are not doing great. They don't know what to look forward to. So all of that is a harbinger of change, in my opinion. Thank you. I, I wanted to sort of get to, to, to issues of housing, um, which are very important to folks of color. Um, I'm a product of, of low-income housing. Uh, my, we were squatters in a vacant building in the 70s, and we were part of the TIL program where folks like Gail Brewer and Ruth Messenger helped us, uh, and Mayor Dinkins as well. What are the barriers that you see sort of that don't allow people of color to have decent housing options or, or home ownership opportunities? I remember working at the New York City Partnership with Kathy Wilde and we were building on city owned lots, um, you know, new homes for people who were sort of moderate um, income individuals to at least have home ownership opportunities. We haven't seen that in a long time. And I'm wondering what can we do to spur that? And what are the barriers that have not allowed that to happen? Well, when you look at it historically, how did uh, low income white people become property owners and homeowners? Well, one way was through the Homestead Act that uh, after the Civil War distributed 80 million acres, um, mainly west of the Mississippi to low income white folks and allowed them to become property owners. Uh, after World War II, literally millions of veterans returning home got zero interest loans from the federal government to enable them to purchase homes. Um, and we haven't seen anything like that when it comes to black folks or communities of color. In fact, we've seen retrenchment in federal, federally supported uh, housing. And so I think, first of all, we need a federal housing policy that's robust. Second, I think we need a regional approach in the New York area. And a lot of that falls on the state, not just the city. Um, there is affordable, cheaper land in Peekskill. It's a quick chain ride, train ride from Peekskill to the city. Um, we need uh, to have a regional approach so that folks can also buy property 
or get cheaper, more affordable housing in areas around New York City. I don't think the city alone can be like the driver when it comes to affordable housing. It's too big of an issue. The last thing I'll say is I think we need to look at zoning and look at our property laws in light of demographic change, meaning increases in the urban population and climate change, meaning we are trying to discourage sprawl, suburban development. We're trying to encourage people to live in cities. That means that unless we have some control over property, the existing owners of property can just suck, you know, rent out of everybody without limit. Um, and I just think we need to think about those things in terms of long-term policy. How we ensure that people are not spending 50% or more of their income just for rent. Absolutely. And what do you think of, for example, I'm involved with a lot of air rights transactions in Times Square, and I know that NYCHA is looking at that as well to mm -hmm. sort of allow for maybe infusion of more capital into NYCHA buildings or maybe other um, opportunities for, for people low income to, to have good places to live. W besides sort of air rights and tax breaks, are, are there any other sort of initiatives or, or partnerships with private real estate developers that we might be able to formulate that can allow for this? Well, I, uh, before leaving air rights, um, I think that uh, I've, I've advocated a public-private partnership to transform NYCHA and take advantage of air rights since Andrew Cuomo was HUD secretary um, and Bill de Blasio was the regional HUD uh, director. And the issue has always been uh, trust on the part of the residents that if, they rent, if NYCHA does do public-private partnerships, taking advantage of uh, development potential, uh, they would be evicted and never to return. And so I, I think for, for something to happen on NYCHA property, there has to be uh, really guarantees that the people who are in public housing now uh, will be able to stay. And also that as a result of these partnerships, there will be more affordable housing opportunities. I do think that's possible. Um, particularly if we get a new administration in Washington in, in January, I think there will, is a possibility for a lot more support for initiatives along these lines. I would also mention that CUNY has about 20 million square feet of uh, unutilized air rights across the city. And we need to start looking at all of these different assets as opportunities to build more affordable housing as well as you know, um, lower cost business um, opportunities, you know, for locating business. I, I think there are a lot of possibilities. Last thing I would say, I think there's a lot unions could do with their pension funds to build housing for their members and other working people. And that's another underutilized resource, I believe, um, because uh, most folks don't lose money building housing for workers or affordable housing. Now, you, you just mentioned the, the unions, which I think are an important component. And I know you're a big advocate of uh, MWBEs. And, and I remember back when we were during the Dinkins administration, where we were really getting the MWBE programs going. And I remember there was a lot more participation by smaller contractors of color and the workforces. You know, it took a lot of work. But it seems like that has gone out of the, you know, there's really, you don't see that as much anymore. And even in, in, in the industry I'm involved with on Broadway, um, there, you don't see people of color in a lot of the different sectors that make Broadway live, um, whether it be stagehands or, or whatever it be, because they're controlled by the unions. So how do we work with the unions, one, to really push them to be more inclusive and two, how do we work with the private sector to really, because there's no accountability for them to hire minority women business enterprises if they're a private entity. So I, it, it's just so complicated. And I know you're very well versed in, in what's going on here. Well, let me start with the MWB issue first. Um, the city has, under de Blasio, greatly expanded in MWBE utilization. Um, the last 
quarter before COVID, it reached 30%, which had long been a goal in terms of contracts, not dollar value, but contracts. Um, so, you know, a lot has happened, but a lot more needs to happen, and we're going to continue on that front. But you're right. Um, there are a lot of private institutions that don't have MWBE programs and could. So hospitals in New York, um, the Greater New York Hospital Association, I believe has a couple hundred hospitals in its network. To my knowledge, it doesn't have an MWBE program and they're buying, you know, 12 billion or so dollars worth of goods and services every year. Um, cultural institutions, other institutions, we, all we should advocate that they all have programs, particularly when they're receiving public subsidy or money and nonprofits are hugely subsidized and our whole, all of our hospitals are hugely subsidized. So we ought to, you know, press them to really hire local and give opportunities to the people in the neighborhoods they, they serve. As far as uh, unions, two things I would say, one, um, we're going to make an announcement hopefully in the next week where we've um, made a real breakthrough with the building trades and uh, they are aggressively um, recruiting from NYCHA, from low-income communities, and they're committed to doing more of that. And we're making that part of our formal agreements on um, when we contract with uh, companies that a certain percentage of people on the job have to be from high poverty neighborhoods or NYCHA. And the building trades are supporting it. And I think this is a historic kind of breakthrough because um, for generations, many black and brown folks have watched people come from New Jersey and Long Island and upstate to do work in their neighborhoods and they had no way in to become a carpenter or an electrician or an HVAC specialist or anything. And that's gonna change. It is changing already but it's gonna change in a big way. Um, you're gonna see an announcement in the next week around that. Well, um, I, I really hope so. Uh, I, I, I would also, with regards to MWBEs, I remember uh, when there was always these ways that sort of majority firms got around sort of the MWBE requirements and they partner with a minority firm or they, the wife would own the building, the, 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 the business. And I'm hearing a lot now, well, there's not a pool of minority businesses in electrical work or excavation foundation work or whatever work it is. How do we build that? Because right now, that's always the excuse. There's not a pool of these potential contractors or, or businesses. And I'm wondering, how do we build that? Well, there won't be a pool unless there's real opportunity. Um, people aren't going to come to New York or invest in building a company if they don't see real opportunity. Um, so last week, the mayor signed uh, an executive order. Uh, one of the provisions was which contracts over 25 million have to come before my office, um, MWBE, as well as the mayor's office of contracts um, for approval so that we can look to break those contracts up if possible to create more opportunities for smaller businesses of which MWBEs tend to be. But we're also reviewing contracts before renewal because one way in which there's not a way in for MWBEs is when agencies just continue uh, renew contracts without rebidding contracts. So we're pulling that back. Um, the other thing we have to do uh, is go outside of New York and recruit in areas where we don't have local MWB capacity. Um, there aren't a lot of Black or Latino engineering firms in New York City, but there are in the United States. And so my approach is we need to go out and invite those companies into New York the same way people went out and tried to get Amazon to come into New York. If it's a high priority to bring in companies that employ folks from the community, um, particularly low-end communities that have a history of doing that, that helps circulate money in the black community, then we ought to be as excited about that as, you know, any tech firm or any other kind of firm that we lay out the red carpet for. So we're beginning to do that. And there also is a whole new generation of younger MWBEs. We tend to focus on construction, but there are plenty of young folks of color who have formed tech companies with a lot of growth potential 
And so we need to be bringing them in too and not just think about MWBE as traditionally confined to certain sectors. Absolutely, because there's a lot of opportunities there, whether it be architecture, architectural firms or whatever, it's more sort of like the soft cost uh, items that you see on construction, but on, on project budgets, engineers, architects, legal, all of those soft sort of things. You never, you don't see black firms retained. Right. I, I, I wanted to address uh, the school system here in New York, you having been a professor at MIT and Columbia. Personally, I'm a product of New York City public schools. And um, I, to me, it just seems like we're going the total opposite direction. Even the specialized high schools now, the, the, the percentage of students of color is so low. I had gone to Brooklyn Tech, um, you know, and I just saw a lot more of kids of color. Now you go to these schools, Stuyvesant and Tech or Science, and you don't see that many students of color. And I'm wondering, what can we do to make our education system better, more equitable? Um, I, I know this is a deep question and people have thought about it a lot, but it just seems like we keep on going around in circles. And I'm just wondering what new initiatives have you been thinking about to address these issues? Well, I would say three things. One, um, when I was at MIT, uh, we got rid of, uh, we stopped focusing on testing or the test as the real uh, indicator of what a student was capable of uh, 10, 15 years ago. And the test, uh, what, what young people get on a test really doesn't predict how they're going to do uh, at MIT. And I would say the same holds true for any university. Uh, the tests don't measure grit and determination. They don't measure your ability to do teamwork, work well with others. Um, and those are vital things to survive really tough programs. Um, I don't care who you are, when you take Calculus two at MIT, which is required, you break down. And, you know, a lot of folks, you know, uh, can't survive that. But if you've been homeless before, or if you've been hungry before, you know what it is to grit it out and hang through a tough time. And we just found that students who had grit, who had been through things in their life, actually perform better. And so something like, 85% of students at MIT run scholarship. Um, they deliberately go after students who, all, from an all-round perspective, you know, can work well with others, can hang in there during tough times, because we have found that better predicts success rather than test scores. So I think the whole method of the specialized schools in New York is way outdated. It's archaic. It is not rational. And I just think uh, personally that it needs to be done away with. Um, and elite universities did away with it a long time ago. Second thing I would say is that DOE and education more generally has to be more tightly connected with where the world is headed and where industry is going. And um, New York City has over 500 miles of coastline. The oceans are rising. So New York ought to be training world-class leaders in how coastal cities adapt to climate change and sea level rise. Because all over the world, folks are going to need that kind of expertise. So here is something with more coastline than virtually any city on Earth. We should be strategically developing capacity in that area and using New York as the lab to launch companies that will have global significance right, and leaders that will have global significance. The same thing goes for building retrofits. We need to retrofit 900,000 buildings in New York for energy efficiency. We should become the go-to place for all the industries that are gonna do that, or for solar conversion from oil and gas to solar. And the same goes for home care. We're gonna have more senior citizens needing home care than any city in the country, and so, telemedicine and using more advanced technology to help take better care of elderly people. We ought to be doing the next generation of those workers who know how to do that, as well as companies that perfect telemedicine for senior citizens. And our educational institutions ought to track where are the jobs of the future, and we ought to start training young people on those pathways now. And that goes from DOE 
through CUNY and other institutions, and we don't do enough of that. The last thing I will say is the elite universities have been working on online education for about 10 years now. And DOE, CUNY started in earnest with COVID. Um, and many people say online education has been a failure. It's been a failure because people don't know how to do it well. And teachers need to be trained on how to use multimedia tools in order to make education at home engaging, exciting, interesting, um, participatory. There are ways to do that. And I think moving into the future, we will be depending on those tools more. So they have the potential to actually unlock a lot of opportunity for kids. I've seen video games that train kids on how to do math and science. That you, kids don't want to leave the game. You got to make them stop using the game to eat. And those games are teaching. And so I just think we need to like, uh, this can be a leapfrog for many of our kids who really never have an opportunity to learn math and science and enter in the tech field. And I think this could be an aid in doing that. So I think we have a lot of work to do in education, but I also think there's huge potential. I want to put in my plug for my idea of a high school for architecture, planning, and real estate. One of the things in, in our industry, and specifically real estate, is that there's really no representation of people of color, very little. And I think one of the things, just to your point, is that on the high school level, we have to get these kids engaged in these different professions so they know that they exist. And, and, and I, I'm, I totally agree with you. I wanted to go back to deal with some historical uh, matters. Economies, economists and other sort of public policy makers have been talking about the New Deal as a framework to spur economic activity. We know that the New Deal was not inclusive of all, was not inclusive. I'll leave it at that. What, what experiences have we learned from them, um, from the New Deal, and how do we sort of not do the wrong thing again if we're going to sort of pursue a New Deal type policies and to reactivate the economy? Uh, the New Deal uh, did a couple of things. One, it created uh, employment through job programs. Um, and the city moving forward can and should do that. And particularly if there's a new administration in Washington, um, one of the candidates for president said that they're going to do massive infrastructure as one of the first things they do. And so there are great job opportunities and we need to make sure that people living in public housing and people in very low income communities have full opportunity to get jobs and learn skills in that process. The New Deal also dealt with a lot of infrastructure issues. It, it electrified farms uh, through the Tennessee Valley Authority in five Southern states. That was done on a segregated basis, um, but it enabled white farmers to actually move out of poverty and many of their kids went to college and you know, uh, had careers afterwards. Many black farmers didn't get electricity and lost their farms. Um, let's not repeat that when it comes to infrastructure this time, whether it's broadband or whether it's microgrids um, or other kinds of infrastructure. But the biggest thing the New Deal did, and particularly the GI Bill coming right after uh, World War II was it transformed uh, vocational and college education. So 600,000 uh, workers got training in the building trades, all the specialized trades, and created the modern building trades. Uh, 60,000 veterans got full scholarships with stipends for food and housing to become doctors. Um, tens, hundreds of thousands got similar scholarships to become nurses. So. The city university has a half million students in it right now from New York City, half full-time, half part-time. That is the major transmission belt for creating the new middle class in New York. And that middle class is overwhelmingly black and brown and Asian. And we ought to have that kind of vision about our educational system and CUNY in particular. If we want to learn from the New Deal, we know how to create a middle class. We've done it before. So we ought to pick up those tools and do it again. Absolutely. I know we've discussed housing and education jobs, and I, I just wanted to know, are there any other sort of crucial public policy 
issues that that you want to talk about specifically that you you're working on well the things i challenge my staff with and and i think all of us we ought to be debating and really working on is uh what does it mean to have a green new york city how are we going to achieve that what does it mean to have a healthy new york city um particularly in light of covid how do we not repeat the disparities and these terrible suffering and death that we see now double in communities of color that we see in other communities. Um, what does a high tech New York City look like? And then what are all of the job and business opportunities associated with these three things? And how do we begin to make sure that all New Yorkers are part of our plan on how to make New York greener, healthier, and high tech? I think that is what we need to focus on. Thank you. And what, how can the business community help? Because, you know, ABNY obviously has a lot of folks who are involved in the business community and they're probably tuning in right now. And they probably, a lot of people want to be proactive as well. What can, what can the business community do to, to sort of help with some of these initiatives specifically? Um, well, first of all, I think the business community uh, can help mentor young people and can help mentor um, MWBEs. I think the business community can, uh, particularly banks and other institutions, can really help a lot with investment right now. Um, perhaps half of uh, Black and Latino small businesses and Asians are threatened with closure. Um, as a result of COVID, and many of them were robust before and can be robust again, but they need help right now. I think the business community can help in putting together um, uh, support and uh, mentorship and uh, through this period of crisis. But the biggest thing I think is how can the business community work with DOE, work with CUNY? How can it help grow you know, the next generation of, of entrepreneurs and businesses that will flourish in a different kind of New York? And how do we work collaboratively as a city um, in reaching those goals? Excellent. I have one more sort of question before we open it up to, to uh, the audience, so to speak. Um, how can ABNY, um, since we are a convener and we're, we're work with a lot of different folks around the city, whether they be academic institutions, private businesses, civic organizations, well, how can we help you sort of achieve some of your goals and the administration's goals and some of the things we've been discussing today? Because they're all very important. I think we all have to chip in. And at, at ABNY, I've been very vocal about the fact that we have to go out there and, and bring in folks that traditionally don't sit around the table at these conversations. And I'm wondering, what can we do? I would love to see um, ABNY convene um, conversations like this one, but I'd like to see many of our elected officials and policymakers at the table. I'd like to see Black Lives Matter at the table um, I'd like to see, you know, many of our academic leaders at the table. So we're all talking about what does it mean to build an inclusive city? What does it mean to build a city that is more robust economically than it is now because opportunity is more widespread and broad? Is that even possible? And if so, how can we do that? And I, I think along the lines of healthcare, uh, real estate and green building, um, climate change, uh, tech, there we can have very focused conversations and have a lot smarter legislation, have a lot better policy, and more win-win kinds of coalitions. Thank you. I think we are ready for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, one was, how can New York City promote employee ownership to support historically marginalized communities in building community wealth? And you can encourage uh, and, com and com build a community wealth. Um, 
that question sounds like a plant. Um, but uh, that this is something that uh, my staff is working on. I've been working on. Um, just for example, uh, there are still about 400,000 manufacturing jobs in New York. And uh, a majority of the owners are baby boomers who plan to retire in the not distant future. The vast majority of them don't have succession plans. And 82% of the employees are uh, black and brown. And so rather than see those businesses go defunct or go under, um, we'd like to see uh, the employees of those businesses um, be enabled to take over the businesses and run them. And part of that is a financial issue, having programs that enable them to buy out the owners. A bigger part of that is actually training. What does it mean to run your own company? But I've seen instances of workers who, when they get to own their own company, um, their productivity levels and their innovation just goes through the roof. And I've sent delegations actually to Mondragon, Spain, to look at a network of 103 businesses, 80,000 workers, all of who, all of which are owned by their employees. And they run all the companies and they do the planning and they distribute their wealth more equally. And this part of Spain went from being the poorest part of Spain to now the wealthiest part of Spain per capita. So I think there are all kinds of ways to innovate. And as we transition to electric cars and new kinds of technology and business, there's, I think, more incentive than ever, ever for employee ownership. Um, if, if you are an employee-owned company, you're not going to introduce robots to put everybody out of work. Uh, you're going to find other things to do with the resources you get from introducing robots. You may retrain workers. You may offer them paid vacations. You may do a lot of different things, start new businesses, but you won't lay everybody off. If we just have our traditional model of investor-owned companies, squeeze as much out as you can, to introduce technology to lay off workers, we're gonna have a bigger, much bigger economic problem in this city than we have right now. We, ha we have an audience question. Um, how can successful black men empower and mentor young black men? Well, huh. um, there is a organization in Brooklyn, uh, it's called the Gentleman's Factory. Um, I think it's called the Gentleman's Factory. And, or Gentlemen's Club. And it was founded by a young Haitian American um, who left the Department of Corrections where he was chief of staff and created a, a, has a building on Flatbush Avenue. And he has 700 members and a four year waiting list. And that's all he does. He brings in successful or older, more senior black business leaders or black leaders in any field and then he organizes get togethers with them and young folks who are looking for opportunity or looking for direction. And it is just an amazing thing. And so I just think we have to do more of that. And we can do develop online tools to do that too. I haven't seen an online black angel network uh, in the business arena, but why not? Um, I, I think this has been a, a huge problem um, in, Black business development, Latino business development. Person who mentored me, two people, Bob Holland, um, who was the first black partner at McKinsey, and Bruce Llewellyn, um, who owned the Coca-Cola bottling company in Philadelphia, but he actually finan financed my PhD at the CUNY Grad Center and helped mentor me. And the person who mentored him was the ship captain for Marcus Garvey's boat line, and that happened to be his uncle. Um, wow. And so, you know, it's, it all boils down to one-on-one, -on -one, each one help one. And it's interesting because uh, I was mentored. I had some very, I tell some people that one of the biggest influences I had in my life was a guy named Joe the Bum, who was a, we call him Joe the Bum, was a homeless guy on the corner of Columbus Avenue. And he used to see me with my books and he used to tell me, you never want to be like me when you grow up. And yeah. I remember that to this day. So mentorship and, and influence can happen in a lot of different ways. I've had black and white mentors, you know, folks like Carl Weiss brought and 
folks like that who've been very supportive uh, of me throughout the, 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 my years. Um, we have a, a question that's a pretty frank question here, and they're, they're keeping it real. It's great that the trade unions want to increase BIPOC membership in their ranks, but let's be frank, some of the same unions have been under consent decrees for almost 50 years because of discriminatory membership practices. The only ones who get rich are the administrator. What makes the city think that this arrangement will change now? So, you know, I appreciate the question. Um, my father was one of a group of ministers and community leaders who sued the building trades in Philadelphia in the early 60s. And uh, the other minister was Leon Sullivan, and they created something called Opportunities Industrial Council to train people outside of unions because Black folks couldn't get in unions. So I'm real familiar, and I used to myself participate in what were called shape-ups, uh, Harlem fight back, Jim Hart. Yes. We used to go to construction sites and shut them down until they hired people from community. But the building trades are the second largest dr job training organization in the United States. They have 1,200 job training centers. They spend over a billion dollars a year training electricians, plumbers, carpenters, and so on. And that infrastructure exists in this city. And so generations of poor Italians became middle class, poor Irish folks became middle class through the building trades. We all pay for this uh, when we pay our tax money. And so I think it is very important that black and brown folks also take advantage of these inf this infrastructure and those opportunities, gain those skills, gain those good paying jobs. And right now the building trades wanna do it. And the reason is because who else is going into the construction these days? Um, if they're going to have a future, it's going to be a black brown future, not a white only future. They know that. And so they are want to change. And so we ought to embrace that. Um, and I'm excited about it. I think it's a new opportunity. Beyond this, I think unions have to change and become more, not just workplace organizations, but workplace com and community hybrid organizations. Um, Unions have health plans that are far better and far cheaper than the health plans that nonprofits tend to have in New York City. So unions, in my opinion, ought to open up their health plans to nonprofit employees. They ought to join together. The nonprofits could save $8,000 per employee probably on their health plan and get better service. And the unions gain new allies and working with community groups you know, I think unions can do a lot more to organize people to bulk purchase goods. Many unions do it for their members, like for eyeglasses or dental care. Why not do the same thing with communities so that people in communities get better prices on cell phones, on cable, on eyeglasses, on, on all kinds of things. I think unions can become more all-purpose kinds of organizations. Thank you. And we have, we wanted to see if you could give us a little sneak peek into the announcement next week regarding the, the union agreement. Can you sort of get, elaborate on what type of training programs will be included or is it, is it a little bit too soon? I, I can't say right now because um, when I leave this call, I'm actually joining a call with the mayor to talk through the details on all of that. Um, so stay tuned. Oh, so. okay, okay. Um, we have um, another one. How do we create succession planning opportunities within a government and other industries for by people of color? People in senior positions helping lower uh, level employees to rise to the ranks and ultimately achieve the mentor's position or equivalent. Well, you know, when Bill Clinton left the presidency, he helped create an organization uh, called uh, Center for American Progress and they raised like hundreds of millions of dollars and developed all kinds of policies um, and infrastructure. And I, they developed an idea infrastructure really for Hillary Clinton's run for president. Um, but when Barack won the presidency, he didn't have a data bank of thousands of resumes and hadn't vetted people for all kinds of positions, but CAP had. And he ended up having to use and depend on the Center for American Progress for a lot of his staffing and a lot of his ideas because he had no infrastructure. 
He had just focused on getting people elected. And so where I started was saying, I think that in New York, we need to build an infrastructure, particularly for elected officials of color who want to make change, but change just doesn't happen on an electoral cycle. You need to have outside organizations, which could be affiliated with CUNY or other think tanks in the city that are just working all the time on developing leaders, training leaders, debating policy, thinking through policy, learning lessons from other places, disseminating those ideas, updating elected officials, educating officials, et cetera. We need something like that in New York. We don't have it. And this is our, thank you. This is our last question for you uh, from Carolyn Harris, who also asked, what about black women, one? And then she also asked, labor costs drive up the price of affordable housing. Don't unions have to be part of the solution to the construction of more affordable housing? So you have two questions there from Carolyn. One about what about black women and the other one about construction costs and unions. Well, um, we use the term called disparity within the disparity. So within MWBE programs and utilization by the city, um, black and Latina and Asian women are absolutely doing the worst in terms of um, securing contracts. And so we are initiating internally programs to basically help black women, help Latina women, help Asian women get contracts. One of the policy changes that we got through the state legislature last year was to allow up to $500,000 for a discretionary contract that doesn't go through uh, the bidding process. And we did that to actually enable us to target Black women, target Latino women. Because of COVID, all procurement rules have been suspended. And so that $500,000 limit what hasn't been utilized as much as it will be or could be. And that's something we're addressing now. But prior to now, say for DOE, the most you could get on a discretionary contract was $20,000. And so $20,000 was not enough for a Black women-owned business to really grow, to really build infrastructure. We think $500,000 will help a lot more. And so we're, we're doing things like that to yep. create more opportunities for uh, women of color. The other issue about unions and affordable housing uh, unions in New York are willing to negotiate on different rates for affordable housing. I think that's important. But I also think it's important that workers who work on building affordable housing can actually afford to live in the affordable housing. And many of them were getting paid so little, they couldn't even live in the affordable housing. Correct. Um, and so we're trying to help the community, and it doesn't help if a worker, you know, we're saying to the community, well, choose between a good job and a place to live. You ought to be able to have both. Um, so that's our goal. Thank you so much, Deputy Mary Thompson. I just, uh, I'm so proud of you personally, and thank you for all the, what you're doing for the city. And we're going to keep on striving, and Abney's going to be working very hard to be a partner with you and every, everybody else who wants to make New York City better and more equitable. So I really want to thank you for all of your hard work and we wish you all of the best. And I think that Stephen is going to join us um, to sign off. Never left yet. So much. Never left yet. Mr. Deputy Mayor, thank you. Thank you for the partnership you've had with us in the past at Abney. Thank you for the guidance you've given us. We hope to build on that in the future. To both you and Julio, we're really grateful for this conversation and the places that it guides us as well as pushes us. And, um, and we're really appreciative. We look forward to doing more. I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, Zoom today. And uh, I hope we see you next week with the head of the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker. Everybody be well, take care, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks. I'll do anything for Stephen and Melva and you, Julio. You know that. So Thank you. Thank Melba. you so much. Love you. Take right. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.